welcome to the CNBC Africa special coming to you live from the Protea Hotel Wanderers in Johannesburg. I'm Kukule Tutele and it's an honor and pleasure to come to you today where we together with the Discovery Foundation we're going to be taking a look at tackling the issue of tuberculosis commonly referred to as TB but uh, today we've had the opportunity to look at presentations that have been delivered by some of our panelists today who paint a very dreary picture of tuberculosis being a, a very stringent disease, second only to HIV and AIDS as one of the most significant killers across the globe. South Africa also has a significant rate of deaths as well as illnesses that occur on the back of TB. But more importantly, what we're trying to do today is not only highlight the challenges that are presented by this particular illness, but finding and sourcing innovative solutions that can be implemented in order to reach some of the goals uh, which have been established by the Millennium Development Goals and the World Health Organization to hopefully be TB free by the year 2050. Well, I'm not alone in order to uncover some of the innovations and uh, unpack this discussion in its totality. I've got a wonderful uh, panel of esteemed guests and very knowledgeable uh, from their different uh, areas of expertise, together with the studio audience who will be participating in the audience, many of them made up of medical healthcare professionals. I'd like to start off by introducing our panelists for today. To my left, Dr. Sunny Babatunde, who's the head of the TB program in South Africa for the World Health Organization, followed by Professor Mike Sateche, who is the chairman of the South African Medical Research Council and professor at the University of Pretoria, followed by Professor Linda Gale Becker, who is the deputy director for the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, as well as the chief operating officer of the Desmond Dudu HIV Center. Therefore, followed by Dr. Maurice Goodman, Morris Goodman, excuse me, he's a Chief Medical Officer for Discovery and the Discovery Foundation Trustee. Last but not least is uh, Dr. Norbert Njeka. He's the Director for TB, Drug Resistant TB and HIV at the National Department of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. It is certainly going to be an insightful hour that we have on the channel as we uh, progress into this uh, discussion. But I'd like us to start by getting a quick fire view of how dire the situation is, especially when it comes to TB infections. We've seen graphs uh, which make comparisons to uh, the city of Cape Town as well as the city of New York, which dates back almost 100 years ago. And I'd like us to start off by looking at a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is the worst case scenario. How far are we in conquering the scourge of tuberculosis before we actually get the zero rates of infections? Dr. Babatunde, let's start off with you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. I think uh, to put it on a scale of uh, 1 to 10 will be quite difficult, but I will say that we are on the right path. We need to accelerate uh, with the response to tuberculosis. Uh, presently, the burden is about uh, 9 million people getting TB every year uh, globally, and we are losing uh, about two million people globally. But the part we are trading now, we are having a sluggish uh, downward trend with the reduction in incidence. It's between 1.5 to 2% annually. And this cannot lead us to a world free of TB. You're not committing to a number, Dr. Babatunde. I acknowledge that. But Professor Satere, maybe if you can give us your rating on a scale of 1 to 10. Well, it might be best uh, to, to, to settle for the middle, uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, of course, we have started, we've made uh, enormous gain in terms of uh, managing tuberculosis up until the 90s, early 90s, when HIV started to come up, mm -hmm. and then it started to go up with it. But I think we are really coming up to, uh, to, to, to tackle it uh, down, so, so, so I would really uh, settle for, for the middle of the road. But we are making good strides, except the fact that we've got to do things differently if we really have to really get it down. Sticking to the mean. Professor Becker, are we making strides? I'm afraid not. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick my neck right out there and say that, you know, I think in this part of the world, and this is the part of the world that I, you know, really am committed to see the difference come, um, I, I think we're failing. And so I'm not sure whether one is the, 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 the dire side or 10 is the, but, but if it is, then I would say that we really are on, on the wrong side of five. Um, and that, you know, unless we really start to say how are we going to control 
this epidemic. So I actually want to get our lexicon right. We do have ways to treat it. We're not doing that well, and they're, and they're connected by all means. Um, and you know, we have great ways, and we're making some innovation there. And there's no doubt on you know on XDR, uh, MDR. We need more drugs and more innovation in that. But if we had good TB control, Dr. Njeka, we would we would not have multi-drug resistant TB or XDR TB. So I think we have to get back to those fundamentals and say how are we going to control this epidemic? It has been done in other parts of the world. I think we have to claim it for Africa and we have to make it happen. And that is going to need a mixture of innovation, commitment, resources, um, and a whole lot of attention on this. I think we've become complacent about tuberculosis and I think every unneeded infection is one infection too many. Mm. Dr. Goodman? I'm going to go the other way. It's <laughs> uh, Discovery, one of our core values is optimism. So where is our... I hear and I absolutely acknowledge the challenge facing us. Um, I'm going to bet on the human spirit and on the African spirit. I think from, as I, as I presented uh, earlier, we've seen through the Discovery Foundation superb innovation and commitment coming from people in this room and, and, and their colleagues. Um, and I think with the political will, which I, I think does exist, if you can see what we've done in terms of the uh, HIV AIDS epidemic uh, and the innovation from, from uh, groups of, of academics and, and, and prof health professionals, um, I think we can turn it around. So whilst acknowledging the challenges, uh, I think I'm going to bet on a higher number in terms of us uh, actually uh, meeting those challenges. Dr. Njeka, I doubt you'll disappoint after what your colleagues have said this morning. <laughs> well, we, we, each one of us entitled to their own opinion, uh, but I think the uh, a situation of TB is, is a serious one and we are on the right path. Uh, we, we, we've passed the 50% mark. We should be somewhere around 6 to 7, moving to our 80, 90%, which is a target by 2020 or what. So we, we, we're moving uh, in the right direction. I, I believe in people. The human beings are your most important resource. And most people out there think that your diamond, your, 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 your computers are more important. No, it's people. And we've got wonderful people. We've got wonderful healthcare workers in this country. It's a pity that uh, uh, we, we picked up, for example, that an average graduate, a good graduate from our local universities, is not good enough to, to help us in the TB program. That's unfortunate. They're very good doctors. They would fit anywhere in the world. They would fit anywhere in the country. But for the TB program, it's a problem. So this has not been something that we shared a lot. We, we're not very good at uh, sharing information. And, and a lot of our graduates have not been taught that TB is, is a, a serious problem to an extent that we, we got, but that has changed. Uh, that is, uh, has changed, and, and I believe we are on the right path. We will pass the, 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 the halfway, and, and we're moving right. We've got uh, sufficient resources. The challenge is how do we use these resources, Start, starting with the human resource that we have. You, you must just look at our research output in this country on TB. We beat all other nations. Now, why can't we translate that <laughs> into reality? Precisely, and that's actually what I want us to delve into is the implementation of this. Uh, Professor Baker, you mentioned the word control, controlling of this particular il illness. As uh, Dr. Njeke mentioned, the research notes are out there, but fundamentally, in order to control this uh, ailment efficiently, does it call for a multi-pronged approach? Because fundamentally, we have the policies which are put in place and the goals and objectives. We have the research that is done. But more importantly, it's the individuals who are on the ground and sitting in this audience today who have to be part of that implementation. How we merge that and bring it together by uh, not only getting parties to speak together, but maybe involving the education department as well, mm -hmm. science and technology to participate as well in innovative solutions. Uh, Professor Becker, I'd like to start with you. Dr. Goodman, feel free to share your thoughts too. Yeah, you know, I mean, I again, and this is not about extolling the first world or the developed world or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I just sat and read the history of the new, the, what happened in New York City, and it seems that there, you know, a lot happened 
all at the same time to try and bring that epide epidemic uh, t together. Now, I want to again reiterate, streptomycin had not even been invented at that stage, and actually TB was brought under control. Now, you know, times change, things are different, we have an HIV epidemic now, there are other things that are going on, but I want to say, you know, I think it is going to be more than just pills. It is going to be a very multiple and, and mixed uh, approach that needs to be put there. The resources are there, but the resources are not overwhelming, you know. So, so I think what we need to do as a thinking, intellectual, researching community is we need to say what are the things that are actually going to get us there quicker? How, how, how do we put those resources to get the bang for the buck? And I think that's what we really want you guys to engage around so that we can say to the WHO, we know you want to bring incidents down, but unless we know how to bring that incidence down, you know, we're not going to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. so I think this is going to be a multi-pronged uh, approach. I do think we have to think outside of the box, move outside of the department, of Health uh, to do this, and I like the way you're already thinking. I think it's the Department of Housing, it's the Depo Department of Tr Transport, it's the Department of Correctional Services. All of these places are going to have to come to the table so that we can really come up with a very concerted effort. Mm. Professor uh, Sachet. In terms of uh, how we also manage it from the colleague's point of view, we've got to really try and uh, re revise how we teach TV. I mean, uh, various modalities and specialties don't actually know the strengths and weaknesses of each other. So if we really have a curricula that is going to be a little bit integrated in terms of TB and HIV, that would also help. And it would also really go down to the nursing, because remember, nurses are still going to be the backbone of what you do. Mm. But in terms of how we train our new doctors, as you were saying, that is not only to teach them to see it from one side at point of view, that would actually contribute to the, to the control. Dr. Babatunde, you had thoughts you want to share? Yes, I, I think that uh, we are saying the same thing when it comes to addressing TB, uh, TB epidemic. Uh, what WHO uh, um, has done is to coordinate a body of experts and arrived at uh, a recommendation that has been ratified by the World Health Assembly and named the NTB strategy. The NTB strategy is a strategy that is replacing this top TB strategy that we have been implementing in the past uh, years. Because the end of, uh, this, this millen end of the Millennium Development Goal is actually the end of the Stop TB strategy. Now we have the end TB strategy. And what does this imply? It implies that we want a world that is free of tuberculosis. It implies that we want to move from the way we've been going before with the sluggish decline in TB incidence uh, rates and all move towards elimination. So TB control is not the language now. We are looking at elimination. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to eliminate, you are looking at multi-sectoral collaboration. You are looking at moving beyond the NTP uh, BP, which is National TV Program as a setup, moving to public-private uh, partnership, moving towards the community, not just community-based organization, but the community as a whole. And also looking beyond the, the, the drugs or uh, the new tools, which are very critical to getting us to the uh, uh, elimination stage, but also the preparation for the optic of these at different uh, levels of um, economic status in the world. Is it low economic? Is it middle class? Is it we have to really be able to do this? But we, I agree with Prof, it's beyond the national TV program, but the coordinating mechanism has to be multi-sectoral, and it has to go beyond just what we are practicing now, innovation in finding cases, innovation in treating cases, innovation, in also making sure that we don't have the pool of latently affected TB population yeah. move to infection, uh, active infection. That is what is required. I'm happy you touched on the programs and the word innovation because Dr. Njeke, in your presentation, you had a line which referred to innovation or back to basics. And I'd like to pick your brain on that. Are we getting the fundamentals correct, especially when it comes to the education of these health workers who are dealing with these particular patients? And more importantly, the, the, the policies that have been highlighted by Dr. Babatunde as well from a global or continental level, are they speaking to the national structures and policies 
policies that are also in place uh, when it comes to implementation. You've got the South African uh, Tuberculosis Control Program, Stop TB, initiatives which uh, take a look at HIV and AIDS and tuberculosis <coughs> together. Uh, are we all singing from the same hymn sheet? Yeah, indeed, we, we are singing from, from the same hymn book. We, we, we subscribe to the NTB strategy uh, to which we participated. We, we contributed to, to the document itself, to the process. Uh, we uh, provided a lot of, lot of input. Um, like I said earlier on, we do have uh, uh, a lot of resources. The challenge has been how do we use these resources. But the other challenge is um, if you look at our research output, it's mainly people describing problems. And it's very difficult for us on the part of government to, to figure out what, what, what we should be doing because uh, the, the space is, is full of descriptions of problems. A lot of the time, these problems, we've known them 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They're being well described now. And, and we have a pressure. Uh, the people of South Africa want solutions. Mm. They want solutions yesterday, <laughs> not descriptions of problems. You will see uh, a lot of the papers describe problems. We want solutions. Uh, for example, why do I say we have, uh, we have uh, a lot of resources? We, we recently received half a billion US dollar to, um, to strengthen TB control in the country. And, and we, we've gone more than halfway with this. We're working with a number of organizations. It's, it's not my job to, to, to give, uh, to say what are the outcomes of this process, but uh, we're working with correctional services, uh, mineral energy. We work with a number of departments to bring them on board so that we improve uh, TB control, for example, among inmates in, in prisons and all that. So the money, we often get it. Uh, the, the, the challenge is usually after you funded people, be it NGOs or various organizations for a lot of money, uh, then after some years we sit down and we describe problems again. Mm -hmm. This is happening a lot and I think we need to really say much as there is, there are some uh, solutions that are being generated, but one coming from, for example, M the drug resistant tuberculosis, there's so much that we still want to find, but most of the time we, we get problems described and, and it, it, it's very difficult. So we need to find a way of using resources better. R our resources should help us solve problems quickly rather than the way we are getting them solved. It takes too long, and the people of South Africa are really not patient enough. We have to solve this. A lot of billions have gone into TB, and, and we, we got to begin to say, this is what is happening with the money of, of the taxpayers. Indeed. Dr. Goodman, I'd like to come to you and then Dr. Professor Sateche. Back to basics or finding those innovative solutions. And more importantly, the alumni who are seated here today who will make their presentations later, how are we speaking with government uh, to implement the possible solutions and not highlight the challenges? I think, yeah, just to maybe endorse what's been said, I think uh, I stressed earlier the importance of, of optimism. I think. The other important thing here is, is bold goal setting, which is, which is great. I mean, the, that we're not looking for half measures, we're looking to eradicate the disease. That's, that's fantastic. Just a, a note to put in there, though, kind of every dream has to have a deadline. And I think what we, what we need to see along the way, 2050 feels like a long way off. Uh, I think we need more tangible, deliverable goals along that route. To the people in this room, I think we've all talked about South Africa being at the forefront of innovation. So that's, that's critical. That is, however, I think within the health sector. I think just to kind of reflect what's being said, the way that we're going to beat this thing, and we are going to, is really looking for innovation in other areas. I was really impressed by Professor Becker's uh, graph showing in New York where you know, the major decline um, in the TB incidents there was before innovation and before drugs and we know that with uh, all the major advances in, 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 in health uh, metrics a lot of the solutions have come from outside the health uh, sector, sanitation etc. So just to uh, say again 
Uh, I think what everyone's been saying, we need innovation across the board mm -hmm. and we need integration and, and synergy. Um, uh, together with uh, political will and leadership, which I think we've got, I think that's, that's the way we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Professor Tateka? No. I, I think when we speak about innovation, we also have to be clear what we're speaking about. It, it's not just doing something slightly different, like increasing 5 milligram to 10 milligram, those kind of... We really have to speak about what is new that is really going to make a big difference. Yes. I mean, if we are going to speak about the new drugs that are coming, there's exciting drugs, how do you actually get to know those drugs without some sucking uh, that... Is, is it three months? Is it six months? Is it nine months that you have to treat the patient? And those are the things that actually you've got to utilize your basic skills, such as, for instance, as I have said earlier in Notre Medicine, you could have an objective way of measuring exactly the activity of the disease. As I have alluded earlier again, that if you are going to really characterize the granuloma perfectly, clearly, then you will know which other drugs are supposed to be used after what time. If you are speaking about the, the things like the caseous necrosis, is it apoptosis that is happening there? Is it the real necrosis? Then if you actually could go into doing innovation, into looking at it, uh, into the very basics, my basics are basic clinical science, looking at that and really then knowing it, understanding it, then you are likely to give correct drugs at the correct time and the correct dose. And that is what will help. And not only that, but it will also help to unravel the issue of getting validated biomarkers. The mm -hmm. issue of biomarkers is still a problem to me because, I mean, how do you use the one that is correct and accurate? And that is where actually you really have to get the basics correct in terms of the integration of basic science and clinical. And, and clinical. I'm happy you touched on that because, Professor Becker, as you also highlighted in your presentation, maybe perhaps we need to highlight these particular areas. Is it when it comes to the, the testing of these particular ailments, uh, like you mentioned, the cough box, uh, the monitoring of carbon dioxide, and even as uh, Professor Satech has alluded to, that medication which potentially will reduce the breakfast of tablets to one pill, which can be taken uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, are you finding that, number one, there's enough funding also coming into those particular spheres? Because for the private sector and those who put their money in, it's a tight rope balance between a profitable return for the investors and acting out of goodwill. So let me say that, and I'm sorry, Morris, that I'm the seemingly the pessimist here today. I'm, it's not usually that I have this title, but I, you know, I do want to say, I think, you know, I, 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 wa I walk the road of HIV and TB. There have been multi, multi millions, millions of dollars gone into HIV basic research. There has been nothing like that in tuberculosis. We still have enormous gaps in our knowledge. I, you know, an HIVologist can tell you how the virus transmits from this individual to that individual, what that pathway is, how it happens, what it looks like when it gets there. We today don't know how the TB actually moves from this individual to that individual. We don't have that basic fundamental bit of information. I'm appalled. We've had this disease for I don't know how long. And one of it is because doctors, scientists aren't going into the field. It's not perceived to be a well-funded, um, you know, basic science um, area. Mm -hmm. and. And we need to attract you guys in there. You know, I, I, I'm very involved in the International AIDS Society. We have this whole program where we try and snick scientists from other fields, um, dermatology, whatever, into HIV. I think we should be doing this in TV, yeah. TB yeah. as well. We've got to get you guys to come into TB. We need new, there are absolute gaps of knowledge that we have to fill and are not filled at the moment. And I would say those are fundamental mm -hmm. for us to find the new drug targets, to understand how we must build our buildings, mm -hmm. how we must redesign our transport, how our correctional services should look, mm -hmm. uh, if indeed we're not going to make them into a melting pot of TB you know, infection, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you know, I do want to put in a big plea, mm -hmm. and I think that's where resources are needed, yeah. um, and that we need to attract our young scientists into the field. Are we working well enough as well with our international counterparts, countries like Cambodia, which have seen a 50% reduction in TB over the last 10 years, uh, and maybe even Ethiopia as well, who've met their MDG target as well. Uh, Dr. Babatunde and, and Dr. Njeka, uh, are we speaking enough to our peers and uh, maybe we need to also incentivize the industry so much more, uh, both from the state and public sector perspective here? I think I, I have to say this, uh, say this loud and clear, uh, like Prof has mentioned. TB is grossly underfunded. 
we don't have funding for TB research. We don't have enough funding for uh, to move innova innovations to implementation and sc uh, scalable innovations to implementation stage. We are still struggling. In fact, that's why the third pillar of the NTB strategy is talking about intensifying research and innovation. And one of the key uh, uh, components that we are looking at, WHO's uh, strategy is recommending here, is that we should motivate for funding for TB research so that we can be able to meet the goal of elimination. If you ask me what are the four things that we need to do, the, where these innovations will come into display and bend the curve, I would say, as my colleagues have said, we need a shorter acting regimen. A regimen that we can use uh, for susceptible TB less than maybe two months that we cure TB, susceptible, uh, drug susceptible TB. And maybe around three uh, uh, to four months for the drug resistance. And even if possible, this, it could be the same regimen curing both drug susceptible and drug uh, resistance TB. Number two, it has to do with the TB vaccine. We need pre-exposure and post exposure vaccine. We have BCG now, it's good for the pre-exposure for the babies, it's preventing them against most serious of TB infection, but it doesn't prevent the, uh, it doesn't prevent pulmonary TB that is even common in adults and maybe the adolescent age group, and it is the cause of the spread of TB. So number three, I will just mention that for the latent TB infection that we have in the, in the community, we should have a way of stopping this from becoming uh, active TB. And lastly, I will say that when we look at all this, we must have a delivery model, a mode, a system that cooperates with the package mm -hmm. that we make sure that when this is introduced at national level, at the global level, we contextualize it into our local epidemic and we are able to deliver it to the system in an appropriate uh, way. Dr. Babatunde, thank you so much. We do have to take a quick ad break, Dr. Njeki, but we'll come back to get insights from the panel because uh, there are many more themes for us to explore. Do stay with us off the break. We continue with the CNBC Africa special. We'll be taking a look at driving innovation and quality service delivery in order to combat the scourge of tuberculosis. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special. As you can tell, we are coming to you live today from the Protea Hotel Wanderers in Johannesburg, where with the Discovery Foundation, we're tackling the topic of uh, using innovation as well as uh, quality service to ensure that we combat uh, tuberculosis on the continent. We've gotten into quite a bit in the first half of the discussion. I think we've just touched the tip of the iceberg because we want practical tools, uh, as Professor Sateche mentioned uh, before uh, we commence with our discussion. But I'd like us to take some questions from the audience. Uh, ultimately, these are the individuals who work with these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And there was a hand at the back. If you could kindly stand up, ma'am, and introduce yourself and pose your question to the panel. My name is Nambule Lomagula. I'm the head of medicine at the University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, in Durban. And uh, I'd like to pick up on the comment that Professor Sateka made that um, in terms of the progress that we're making, that there was progress until the HIV epidemic came into the picture. And for us to really make the progress that we really want to make, we have to sort out the HIV epidemic. Because currently, I don't think that we are in a position to be asking more from government as far as the HIV, managing the HIV epidemic is concerned, because I think we have the best policies that we could ever ask for. But the reality is that we are still living in a South Africa that looks like it's the pre-antiretroviral era. Because where I come from, where we are hardest hit with the HIV epidemic, we still have patients coming in with CD4 counts of fours and twos when we have antiretroviral treatment available. And these are the patients that have the form of TB that 
we can diagnose easily, which I think uh, if we had had uh, Professor Sathekhe's presentation, he could have shown us how you know, it impacts on that. We're seeing uh, patients with uh, uh, pericardial tuberculosis, abdominal tuberculosis, and so on and so forth, which is very difficult to, to diagnose. And furthermore, in the patients with, which, who are infected with HIV, we are actually seeing the extra, the drug-resistant form of TB. So I'm, I'd like to throw out a challenge to us as clinicians to ask ourselves whether we are really doing enough. Because I think we have, uh, with the help of discovery, we've really become highly specialized. And can we really say, as clinicians living in a country that is hardest hit with the HIV epidemic, that we as clinicians in the spaces that we are working in, that we are doing enough to tackle the HIV epidemic so that as a consequence of that, as a, as a, as a mm -hmm. benefit of HIV epidemic uh, tackling, that we can actually deal with the problem of HIV, of TB, in the way that we would like to. Nombulela, thank you so much for your question, ma'am. Uh, we will raise it to the panel. We'll take another two questions so that the panel can address them. There are two hands at the back, the lady in the corner <coughs> there and the gentleman towards the front. If the mic can make its way. Oh, we'll start with the gentleman at the back. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Sipom Folozi. I'm a uh, forensic pathologist from the University of Cape Town, um, also doing a PhD in forensics um, at UCT. I just wanted to touch on the subject of innovation uh, with regards to the issues of TB. Um, I've been privy to a group of American uh, scientists who came to the Department of uh, Engineering at UCT, um, exploring many ways in which uh, technology in engineering can be used to study how HIV is transmitted uh, from person to person using computational fluid dynamics. And what I would like to say in my experience is that um, we as medical professions are sometimes so close to the problem and we only know about medicine such that you know, other, other methods in which uh, the solutions to TB can be tackled are outside of the, our fields of, of knowledge or expertise. Um, and I'd like to go back to what was said earlier about other, other sectors of, um, of science being involved in, in tuberculosis. For instance, um, I'm a believer that prevention of TB spread can, can be uh, affected by use of technology in the patient who is a, um, a, a shedder of the virus, such as um, implants that irradiate uh, the bacterium from the exhaled uh, breath. Uh, which can be implanted in the in the airways of the patient. Mm -hmm. All those things. What I'm trying to say is that all those things can be uh, can can be achieved. But it's the, the problem is that we, as as the medical profession, only know about our field, and we don't have the the expertise of other other aspects of of science in bringing uh, those th that those knowledges together for solutions. Thank you so much, sir. Well, unfortunately, we have to keep it brief. We've got one more question from the gentleman towards the passage here. If you could please stand up and introduce yourself. Good morning. Sir. My name is uh, Ben Gaunt. I'm a doctor at a rural hospital in the Eastern Cape. So I have a question from the kind of the other end of the spectrum, perhaps. And my question is really just whether we've learnt, uh, ironically, the lessons from the HIV epidemic, where we engaged our patients more and we put responsibility in their hands for taking their treatment properly and we educated them about their treatment and about the side effects and about how they got HIV in the first place. And I just wonder whether we perhaps don't do that quite enough. We've tried it a little bit um, in my particular institution, and I must say it makes the world a difference when patients understand you know, what's going on. There are a lot of people who still think you get TB from dust or you get TB from all sorts of other things other than mycobacterium tuberculosis. And, and I think that, I, I mean, I'm personally not a big believer in dots in a context like mine. And so my, my question really is, are we being innovative in the space that explores how to improve our patients' engagement with their treatment because actually it's people taking drugs in the context of their family that makes a huge yeah. difference. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much for your questions. We'll come back in the second half to address those questions, but I'm hoping we can actually tackle them as a group as well, uh, especially linking Nombulelo and George and Ben as uh, questions uh, with regard to HIV. Number one, shouldn't we be learning lessons here uh, from how we conquered the HIV epidemic and more importantly, the patient uh, treatment engagement? Maybe DOTS is a bit too much of a strenuous and uh, cumbersome uh, method of uh, monitoring treatment.
Anyone who's open to taking that question? I'd, I'd be happy to tackle that one. I'm very passionate about it, having you know re worked at the rock face as well, certainly in the HIV epidemic, and also worked in KwaZulu-Natal in the DOT system. Um, I think there is a huge amount that can be gained from this notion of patient uh, respect, pa mutual, you know, the client-centered approach. So. Yes, our client should know what they're taking. I, I actually believe they should know the name of the drug, <laughs> by the way, as opposed to the pink pill or the blue pill. Um, and they should really be engaged, you know, one-on-one -on -one in, in the process. And so I do think there's been an extraordinary innovation. I think that just scale um, came at us in the HIV world that, it, you know, almost forced much more of an egalitarian client-centered approach where we gave the responsibility back to the client. And it hasn't always worked brilliantly, but I think even more, you know, we've seen it in HIV. And I think, unfortunately, the sort of DOTS mentality is one of, I am the provider, you are the patient, shut up and take your pills. Or what's more, somebody's going to come and watch you take those pills, you know, which is even perhaps even more sort of patronizing at some level. So I do think there are some real things we can gain from HIV in terms of our, our sort of adherence clubs, the community mobilization the community uh, dece you know, de decentralization that's happening. And I think we're starting to see that. And again, this country leads the way in that. And I think that is where we can absolutely teach the, you know, the rest of the world on, on how to do this. So I do agree that I think those innovations are, are absolutely right at our fingertips. And we should be learning from each other in terms of best practices, because you hear this, little pockets of great stuff going on. We need these kind of forums to say, OK, it worked for you. What can we take on mm -hmm. and, and really start to share those best practices. I'd also like us to tackle the issue of innovation. Uh, uh, Professor Satech, I'm not too sure if you might be best positioned to answer this one, but learning from areas outside of the medical fraternity in order to uh, conquer. I mean, then uh, uh, we're in the CAP SMRC. It, it's, in, it, it's important that's what actually we are trying to also fund. Currently, we're funding a tune of 235 to $235 million. And in it, we want programs and innovation that will have uh, collaborating ideas, uh, collaborating centers that would actually uh, inform us what is happening from epidemiology to you know, vaccines to, um, to, to new drugs. So that the, the, the programs that are happening at the moment, with it, before I forget, with your permission, I must also urge colleagues to apply for this uh, Newton Fund that is also out. It will close on the 4th of uh, September. And, and again, we are looking for ideas from people so that we can implement and help you uh, execute those ideas. But the innovation is really going to come from uh, learning from each other. I mean, you cannot build thing, uh, you know, you need diverse information. You need diversity in all its perspective, from black, white, to basic, to clinical. Mono, mono ideas will not work. If I may throw a spanner in the works here, are we also ignoring, given your presentation, Professor Becker, uh, the fact that HIV-negative people are the carriers as well of uh, tuberculosis? Are we also ignoring the fact that perhaps they should also receive come some kind of treatment? Because uh, as someone as well outside of the medical fraternity, all I know about TB is the advert that I see on TV about the puppets, where you see the coughing and take your treatment, take your pills, and you'll be fine. Uh, but uh, maybe, again, there needs to be aggressive marketing uh, for people to have a greater awareness. Uh, the same that was done with HIV. HIV, as uh, one of the uh, speakers mentioned today, that needs to be highlighted with TB and focus on those uh, HIV-negative individuals. Uh, 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 Dr. Goodwood, you, Goodman, you can I go think, ahead. Uh, we're challenging ourselves here to be innovative and think out of the box. So I've just um, thought of a, 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 a sort of uh, current epidemic that we're wrestling with in this country, that of non-communicable diseases, um, where at Discovery we, we've done a lot of work they're understanding behavioral economics and how in, in that uh, epidemic a lot of the prevention and management comes from the patient. Mm -hmm. And there's really been huge uh, advances made in behavioral economics. Everyone knows they shouldn't smoke, but people still smoke. They mm -hmm. know they should exercise, but they don't. Um, and there's really been an explosion of knowledge in understanding how do you get people to actually do the right thing. It just struck me. Uh, as we're chatting here, that there's a, that's a whole parallel area of research. I'd like to where tease you and say, are you perhaps uh, offering from. a vitality service for those who take care of TB efficiently? <laughs> we probably could. <laughs> probably could. 
On that note, we'll continue taking questions from the floor. There were several hands up here in front. Uh, perhaps if the microphone, we'll start with the lady over here, and it will make its way down to the two ladies as well, as well as further down the passage too. Uh, hi. It's can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> My name is Marie Retief. Um, I'm a psychiatrist at Stellenbosch University. Um, we know that um, mental illnesses like anxiety and depression have, have severely adversely affect compliance and adherence to medication. So I was just wondering if, if screening and treatment of common mental illness is, is part of our um, protocols and, and, and implementations, because I think that will contribute also greatly to, to fighting the, the TB fight. Thank you so much for your question. If you can move the mic further down. We've got a question right here. Hi, good morning. Thank you. My name is Dr. Lee Gail Adonis, and I'm a public health physician. Um, we heard earlier on a statistic that said that quite a high proportion of TB patients are using alcohol in a harmful manner. So um, we know that's also a contributing factor to non-adherence to TB medication. Because we know that when you on TB meds and you drink alcohol, you feel pretty bad. So when you have a choice between taking your TB meds and drinking alcohol, we know who's going to win. So my question is, what kind of strategies are in place and can be done to combat the use of alcohol in a harmful manner in this particular population? And then similarly, in the vein of the non-communicable disease epidemic that we're currently facing, these people are now at risk of developing non-communicable diseases with their high alcohol use and perhaps other lifestyle factors. So what kind of integrated strategies um, can be utilized to to uh, combat these epidemics um, in, a, in, a, in a very sustainable manner. Thank you so much for your question. We'll take one more from the lady behind you. <coughs> if you could please then introduce yourself, ma'am. Hi, I'm Dr. Julian Campros. I am from Dunfontein. I used to be in family medicine, but now I'm currently a lecturer training undergraduate future doctors. Um, my question, firstly, my comment, Dr. Baker, you are not a pessimist. <laughs> you are a realist. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, I hear stories of interns, undergrad students, uh, doctors, nurses becoming infected with TB. Do you have any statistics on the number of healthcare workers infected, TB, MDR, and XDR? And do you think they are becoming infected in the workplace? Thank you so much for your questions, all very relevant. Uh, perhaps let's start with the last one we got from Janine and then work our way up again to Leanne and Marik's question. Uh, uh, Professor Becker, if you could respond to uh, Janine's so I'm, question. Regarding I'm wondering if, if, if Dr. Njeka has the actual numbers. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I don't have them on my, at my fingertips, but obviously there's huge concern around this issue of occupational acquisition of tuberculosis. And I must say, so I, I will share that I myself have had TB twice as a young doctor in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so I've, but thank God, absolutely susceptible to tuberculosis, and I've been treated, and I'm, and I'm. But I'm aware that we have colleagues who have battled with multidrug and and even more severely resistant TB. So you know, I think this is a real concern, um, and and maybe contributing to the fact that you aren't seeing young doctors moving in this direction because I think that concern is is valid. Um, so I do think that. You know, that part of, and I know there are policies, uh, but I think we could be putting more effort and more energy into making sure those policies are really strong as to how we protect um, healthcare workers. It's not just doctors, it's nurses, it's cleaners, it's everybody mm -hmm. who's going into our healthcare facilities. And I would say that is the one place where it really makes sense to me to have an, a strong infection control pro, you know, policy um, around making our health facilities as safe as possible, mm -hmm. making sure that ventilation and shared air is, is minimized as much as possible. I, you know, I, I understand it less in terms of TB control, because I always say to people, you're more likely to get your tuberculosis actually coming in your communal cab to the clinic, um, sharing that shared air than you are to be getting it at the health facility, because actually people don't spend a lot of time at health facilities, but they spend a lot of time in Shabines and in other venues where they gather. Uh, you know, and that's again where we need to start thinking outside of the box. Mm -hmm. A lot of effort has gone into infection control in our health facilities.
facilities? Correctly so, because of our, I think about protecting our health professionals. But then again, infection control beyond that uh, needs to be thought about as well. And it is, again, underpins why we so badly need a vaccine. We so badly need to understand how we protect people from latent infection. But indeed, what does that mean? I don't mm. think we've completely unpacked. In the sea of tuberculosis, and I'm going to be very pessimistic again and frighten you all off, but in the sea of tuberculosis, if you treat somebody prophylactically, do you actually incur more risk now from you've now cleared yourself of your wild type infection is this problematic if indeed you encounter a multi-drug resistant case I, you know i don't think we know really that's the level of our understanding here and i think it's really important that we very honestly and realistically pack these pieces apart and 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 engage with each other to really understand what mm. it means for our healthcare force we can't do this without the healthcare force so so I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I don't have all the answers, but I think it needs much more dialogue in, in, in the field. Thanks for your response, Professor Baker. Dr. Njek, I'd like you to uh, potentially also tie in your response, not only to Janine's question, but more importantly, uh, a question raised by Leanne with regard to alcohol abuse and, and the integrated strategies uh, from multiple disciplines uh, in order to, uh, number one, address the issues of alcohol abuse as well as the proper intake of uh, uh, medication. And also coming back to Marika's question uh, with regard to mental illness. Is this something that perhaps healthcare workers themselves are as well, who are out on the ground, are cognizant of when treating TB patients? No, no, I, 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 they're not. I think that's very important. It's, it's a very important issue. And the three questions are really uh, very, very important. And, and they point to what's our weaknesses. Uh, the, the, the number of healthcare workers uh, that get TB, we do not have this report uh, routinely. We do receive some, um, we ask from provinces. We, we get uh, numbers from fewer provinces and uh, not everybody so i don't think it it makes good sense to publish those because they're not really a reflection of what is going on in the community but we know uh, from all research done in places like KZN, and some hospitals and western cape and other provinces that the um, incidence of tb among healthcare workers is higher than the general population mm -hmm. i think that's really what uh, what should should be worrying us. Uh, we, we definitely need to, to change the manner in which uh, that we handle that. But I'd like to say that the, the weaknesses that we point to TV now are not necessarily the weaknesses of uh, uh, tuberculosis control program. These are weaknesses of our health system as a whole. And, and I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, alcohol uh, cigarette smoking. We treat these patients. We see on record that a significant proportion of them do abuse these substances. Uh, but uh, there, there is no mechanism in the health system, and of course not even in TB, uh, that, <coughs> that uh, motivate patients to change behavior, even if it means only during six months TB treatment. We do not have a such mechanism. Uh, we quick to have terminology such as default for TB treatment and this and that. Uh, thanks God, we now call them loss to follow up. We no longer say default. Uh, we used to call them suspect when yes. we think they yes. be, but now we no longer say that. We, 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 so the tough things are improving, but, but the system uh, was really set up in this fashion in a way, and, and for some of us, like when I was studying family medicine, mm -hmm. looking at the terminology of TB, it was really uh, very difficult even for myself because in, in TB control, a, a patient is a case. And that really contradicts my, my understanding, my belief. This is a case becomes a suspect. I mean, the suspect becomes a case, can be can default and all that. So we, we have a system mm. that, that, that has set up all these things and now we, we really uh, are changing them. But um, yeah, we, we, we should have uh, routine screening of mental health so that when they are lost to follow up, we begin to understand what is really happening at a normal. Uh, I agree, we need to learn a lot from, from HIV uh, in terms of educating patients. But I want to caution to say uh, the way TB 
collect data and disseminate is different from HIV, we need to be careful. TB is the one program that gives you an account of each and everybody that comes into the program. If you ask me, how many people did you get to treatment during 2012 or 2013, and what has happened to each one of them, I can tell you. But with HIV, uh, we, we got this big research, big uh, publications, we've tested so many millions, we've put on treatment yeah. so many, but nobody can tell you exactly, for example, last two years, how many people were put on treatment, what has happened to each one of those individuals. So, so HIV has got to learn something from TB in terms of how you report your outcomes, because so we're yet to see, up, we're yet to see that kind of report. I think the public of South Africa need to know this, uh, because you can't just say, we, we're not comparing apples and apples when you say that this report is bad compared okay. to the other, because they look at things differently. Dr. Njaka, I'm going to ask you to pause it there. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are only left with five minutes uh, until this broadcast does come to an end. But ultimately, the important word was mentioned today, action and implementation. And I'd like to draw it closer to three particular areas that I'd like us to focus on in your closing comments, which you'll each have 50 seconds mm -hmm. uh, to do. Uh, when it comes to skills, the developments and the, retention and the retention of these particular skills, when it comes to finding innovative strategies uh, to help find cures for tuberculosis, more more importantly, identifying particular areas which we need to innovate in, because uh, we can't just innovate in general, but none of them actually uh, work in synergies. And more importantly, with regard to integration, are there particular uh, themes and ideas uh, that uh, each of you can make commitments to under all of these particular umbrellas that I've uh, alluded to? Dr. Babatunde, yes. 50 seconds. <laughs> I, will, I will just quickly say that um, any, any country, any individual can be innovative. But what is important in the fight against TB is that the innovation must be a need-based innovation. Mm. And that need-based innovation in South Africa today should be directed by the National Department of Health because we have a unique epidemic and the prioritization of what do we need to innovate in can emerge from strategic plans and research plans that can emanate from the department in collaboration with other stakeholders. Professor Satefa? Well, we've got to change the mindset of how we tackle uh, tuberculosis, and in it, we've got to try and be inclusive. By that, we will find our validated biomarkers, and to find validated biomarkers, you really have got to have a way of imaging those biomarkers. So, you know, my response here is really the word control again. I think we should definitely aim for control of tuberculosis. I don't think we should set our sights any lower than that. But it, part of that is that we have to continue to treat the epidemic that we already have to the best of our abilities. And I would argue that we have many of those tools already. What we have to now do in our innovation is understand how to apply those tools in the best possible way. And that brings all of us into the field. But how we actually stop the infection in the first place, that is the challenge I throw out to all of you. And I would imagine you all are going to sit down and either apply for this grant or another discovery grant, because there's so much to be learned in tuberculosis still. The, the the field is rich and needs strong, creative, absolutely, you know, out their minds to get us to that goal. And, and we, we need you all to do that. So, Dr. Griffin? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody. I've learned a fortune here today. I think maybe two things uh, that I'm going to take out of here is the one to crudely put it is maybe marketing. I mean, when the people were juxtaposing HIV and AIDS and TB, Kind of AIDS exploded on the scene. We un we united as a nation, and again, the TB's kind of always been there. And uh, maybe we need more TB adv uh, advocates. We mm. need uh, activists. We need better marketing, if you will, of that to get the resources and and, and unite us behind that disease as we have uh, behind HIV and AIDS. Uh, and then more in in the purvey of the foundation, certainly. Um, we can uh, challenge ourselves to look at funding creative innovations, maybe outside the area of, of, of strict medicine that we've been uh, looking at uh, up to now. I mean, there have been lots of ideas shared about how those innovations can come from other fields. Uh, we, can, we can look at how uh, exercise our minds and how we can uh, encourage that kind of creation.
Dr. Njeka, the man with the last word. Yeah, I think the, the, it's obvious from what we've heard from the audience and from the panelists. Uh, the, the, the core business of handling TB is left to with uh, the TB control program. So government uh, departments should come together. I think it's important that we, we strengthen our interaction with other state departments, be it education mm -hmm. or, or correctional services, mineral and energy. We need to come together. Partnership is critical. We, we can't do it alone. We, we have a lot of non-governmental organizations in this country that are really supporting us and our own universities. There are a lot of uh, people, good people here with a lot of knowledge. I believe if we utilize all that, we'll be able to, to, to improve on in a manner that we treat our patients. Uh, we need to improve in educating TB patients and in measuring adherence, keeping them uh, to care. Uh, linking them effectively and keeping them uh, in care. I think that's the, those are my last words. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much for your closing comments. Now, many of you might recall that at the top of this conversation, I asked the panel how they think we fare on a scale of 1 to 10. No particular numbers were given, but we were told we sit at 5, below 5, slightly above 5. But from the audience, I'd like to just gauge, uh, following this conversation today and the conversation that will continue to take place on the sidelines today, uh, those who believe that we might be below 5, show of hands. Those who believe that we might be above five, show of hands. There we go. Well, I take it uh, uh, that is a clear direction as to uh, where we fare. Almost 50-50, but a lot of work still needs to be done. And that's where we do wrap up our conversation for today, the special broadcast which has come to you live from the Protea Wanderers Hotel. And the conversation will continue on the sidelines. You too can participate using the hashtag DiscoveryTBTalk. But I'd like to thank my extremely knowledgeable guests who've joined us on our panel today for sharing their insights with us. Dr. Sani Babatunde, who's the head of the TB program in South Africa for the World Health Organization. Professor Mike Satecha, who is the chairman of the South African Medical Research Council and Pretoria University professor. Professor Linda Gale Becker, deputy director for the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town and the chief operating officer for the Desmond Dudu HIV Center, followed by Dr. Morris Goodman, chief medical officer at Discovery and Discovery Foundation trustee, and not forgetting Dr. Norbert Njeka, director for TB, drug resistant TB and HIV at the National Health Department. From myself, Kukule Tukele, and the team that's uh, brought this to you, it's been a pleasure bringing this broadcast to you. Do stay tuned as the conversation continues on the sidelines. It's goodbye for now. <laughs>